antivirus recommendations for Linux, physical security suggestions, and hardware versus software crypto wallets. Welcome to the Surveillance Port 205 Q&A, where we answer questions from our amazing patrons who allow us to make this podcast for all of you and keep us going with their support. You can view and join the questions on patreon.com slash surveillance pod and xmrchat.com slash surveillance pod. With that, let's dive in. Our first comes from our longtime regular, David Johnson, who says, what real-time behavioral antiviruses do you know of and recommend for Linux? Perhaps the most well-known antivirus for Linux is ClamAV, which seems to be signature-based rather than real-time behavior-based. At present, most vendors that offer Linux antivirus seem to be enterprise-oriented. So the only way to order is you have to contact sales. It's unclear how much it costs for an individual, which is probably way more than an individual is willing to pay, if we're being honest. Uh, How much personal privacy there is that you have to give up for that device, and how much protection they actually offer. How do you see and deal with this issue? So first of all, for those who don't know, that kind of used to be how antivirus worked was every time they found a new virus, they would add what's called a signature where they would basically say, if you see this code, it's malicious, you need to block it. These days, most antivirus does what's called, I may be saying this word wrong and I apologize, heuristic analysis, which is they're not so much looking for the signature itself, which they, they still might be doing that, but they're more relying on what is the program doing? What kind of permissions is it asking for? What files is it accessing? And is this doing the same things that a malicious program would do? And this is far more effective. Again, most antiviruses do this nowadays, except for Linux, because we're a little bit behind the curve. So I do agree the most well-known is definitely ClamAV. And I I apologize, I did shorten your message here in the the show notes, so I don't see it all. I think you did mention it's probably better than nothing, which I, I do agree with. Just to get to the point of it, what real-time antivirus do I know of? I don't know of any. You could try hitting up some of the the common ones like uh, Bitdefender or Malwarebytes, see if they offer anything for Linux, but honestly, I don't think most of them do. So there's a few ways that I deal with this issue personally. First of all, I use Cubes because I'm an absolute lunatic. I do not recommend that for most people. I really like Cubes, but I will be the first to admit that it is overkill, even for my threat model. I use it more because I like it rather than because I actually need it. It's very not user-friendly. There's a steep learning curve. There's a lot of limitations, especially when it comes to like running programs, playing games. It'll browse the web just fine. It'll check your email just fine. It'll do like snap packages just fine. That's about it. So my point being not not a feasible solution for most people. I honestly think these days you can get really far with just basic internet common sense. Don't click every link you you see. Use strong passwords, strong password manager, two-factor authentication. Keep your stuff updated. I think for most people, antivirus in general is not really necessary. However, with Linux in particular, I think there are still some things you can do to harden the system. You could use virtual machines to open links or attachments you're unfamiliar with. There's things like Flat Seal or App Armor that you can use to like harden different programs and kind of sandbox them a little bit better. You could try using immutable distros like Fedora Silverblue. I think there's one for Ubuntu that I can't remember off the top of my head. It's been a while since I've seen it, but I know Henry did, and you were probably going to mention this, you did a Linux guide. And I think in the more advanced steps, you did go over some of this stuff. I'm sure it's still, at very least, mostly current, if not still completely relevant. So I would go check that out. Probably the most current of all our device guides. As far as I know, there haven't been any major changes over the years outside of maybe atomic distros being a little bit more popular and recommendable. But that's pretty much all I got. Yeah, I think it's tough because if anything, even if antiviruses aren't ultra effective, they still give peace of mind. And I think it's a cool thing to have a little bit of more peace of mind, especially for people who need that, which probably isn't many people listening to this podcast. But I know a lot of people think and don't feel safe using their computers if they don't have an antivirus because it's such a part of their workflow. And for better or for worse, I think that's important to them is feeling safe. And I think not having that on Linux could be a turnoff for people. I don't think it's the number one turnoff for people moving to Linux, but I think it's just something to keep in mind. Either way, Linux has some things working for it. We've talked in the past, and again, this is, do not take what I'm saying out of context, but security through obscurity, you're just a lot likely to get malware in the first place on Linux because people aren't really developing malware at scale for Linux because there's fewer users who use it. There's also the fact that Linux users tend to be more technical, so they're probably going to be a little bit more savvy in terms of dealing with malware, hopefully. So I think that there's less chance that you even have to deal with malware in the first place. We just covered in the last episode the first ever UEFI boot kit that was found for Linux devices. Meanwhile, there's been a lot of other ones for things on Windows, for example. So we've always kind of described antiviruses as a safety net. If you think of a a football game, soccer, football, whatever you want to call it, you got your whole team, you got defenders, you have a goalkeeper, and then you have the net to make sure the ball doesn't go onto the road, right? 
And I think the antivirus in everybody's workflow should be the safety net. Ideally, they don't score a goal. Even if they score a goal, hopefully your antivirus is the last possible thing. So at worst, you're missing out on that safety net. But for all of you out there, you can have good defense, you can still have a good goalkeeper, and you can kind of use all the tips that Nate just shared and also our Linux hardening guide covers and the Techler side of things. And you should be fine. Real quick for uh, patrons, because nobody else will know what we're talking about. While we're talking about malware, I remembered to go ahead and finish sending my thing to iVerify. No threat detected. So my iPhone is safe. Next question is from Rasta about the joke of using the $5 wrench to bypass encryption and digital security. Expanding on that thought process, do you have any advice or resources for physical security around the house? I know the threat model of a home invasion or anything is a bit extreme, but some people do have it. And actually, Jonah and I, Rasta cross-posted this question between Techler and surveillance support, and I already kind of answered and gave my answer on the Techler side of things. Cheating. So... I will leave it in Nate's court to take to tackle this one. Was that on the, the latest Techler talks? Yeah, the live stream. I ask because I'd be curious what you guys have to say. But yeah, my uh, my two cents, I guess. First of all, I think I don't think that's a bit extreme. Like statistically speaking, yes, I think it's a bit extreme. I think it's unlikely to happen to most people. I looked that up. I looked the statistics up for a blog post one time. So I know like statistically speaking, Most people will not have to worry about that. But also, you don't have to go very far to find a person who's been robbed. So I I do think physical security is actually really important. And I I do touch on it a little bit here and there. I think I did actually write about it in a blog post a long time ago. Your options vary wildly depending on what kind of home you have. First of all, I'm not really a big fan of security systems. Maybe like a, a video doorbell. And I mean, that's a whole separate question that I think we've actually had before about like privacy respecting security cameras and stuff. Maybe something like that might be useful. But as far as an actual like ADT or Simply Safe, it, from what I've heard, they just don't work because, well, let me rephrase that. From what I've heard, they're more about capturing evidence for the police to use later. They're not actually about stopping the crime because first of all, as soon as something happens, they're probably going to call you and go, hey, is this like your cousin that you forgot was coming over? Or is this actually, oh, this is actually a crime? Cool, let's call the cops. And then the cops might get there in about 10 minutes if they're lucky. And I have reason to believe that a even semi-skilled criminal can be in and out in a place in about 10 minutes. That's kind of their deadline is like 10 minutes. They take the most valuable, easy to carry stuff and they're out. All that to say, I, I'm not a real big fan of security systems, or at very least, I think they're like a VPN. I think you should invest in other stuff first. If you live in a house, solid core doors. I want to say stronger windows. I might be making that one up, but I think the windows are usually pretty weak and can be reinforced. There's kits you can buy online for a couple hundred bucks that'll reinforce the hinges of your doors. You can put in longer screws. That one goes for renters as well. Just kind of look around your house. Do you have a ladder that's sitting outside? Maybe lock it up so they can't use that to like break into the second story window where the windows aren't as good. If you have like a big sliding glass door, I mean, there's nothing to stop them from throwing a rock through it, but you could at very least put like a lock on it. So it's not so easy to open. Same thing you would with regular threat modeling, like walk through, if I was a criminal, how would I get into this building? If you have a keypad, you know, instead of like a regular door lock, where do the keys wear off? That gives away what the pin is. Where do you store your safe key? Like, you know, if you have one of those fake rocks, they're usually pretty easy to check, you know, under the doormat, under the planters, people are going to check for that kind of stuff. I would say it probably doesn't hurt to put like an ADT sign in the yard or in the window, even if you don't have it, because at very least, like I said, that'll make them think they're on a time limit and maybe they won't steal everything. You know, they'll just kind of grab the the biggest items and leave. If you're in an apartment, I always advocate for second floor or higher. The screw thing, you can replace most door screws are like half an inch, which I, I think I've said this before. I'm pissing so many people off on YouTube right now. My ears are one inch. So a screw half that size is holding in your door. I could kick that down on my worst day. That's bad. So you can replace those with like two inch screws and that's way better. You can't really replace the door. The the landlord probably won't let you do that. Or if you're renting a house, you could ask the landlord. I think the other big thing is, and this is more of a like after the fact kind of thing, but inventory, inventory everything. Write down, take pictures, make, model, how much it costs, serial number if they have it, because then if you get robbed, it's so much easier to turn over a list of gear to the cops and be like, this is the exact serial number, this is what it looks like, this is how much it's worth, et cetera, et cetera. Last thing is I would say, you're talking about home invasion specifically, some kind of weapon, even if you're an anti-gun person, baseball bat, katanas, if you know how to use them, that's the other thing, take a basic self-defense course. Like you can buy the most expensive decked out gun in the world, but if you've never gone to the range, you don't know how to shoot it. You don't regularly shoot it. It's not going to do you any good. You know, if, if you get a baseball bat and you've actually like practiced with it a little bit and practiced moving down the hallway with it, you're probably going to do better. Did I miss anything? 
No, it's kind of like asking if you were new to this podcast and you went, hey, I know people always talk about the $5 wrench, but how do we how do we make ourselves secure online? And we go, oh, well, that's a, that's a that's a big question. So that's let's let's dive into it. And there's go a into, lot to it. <laughs> so there's a lot going on. And I think Nate gave as good of an overview as you can possibly give, because there's entire channels and communities dedicated to just this, just like we have our whole community dedicated to just this. So it's very complicated and the weeds are very, very extensive and they can be as extensive as you want them to be. I know some people have like you, you can go as, as far as you want with this. The last thing I wanted to say was like Henry said, if you can find a good and I don't have any, unfortunately, if anyone knows some, please don't leave some in the comments. If you can find a good YouTube channel or podcast or community where people discuss this kind of stuff, even if it's just one or two of them, and even if they just do the very, very basic stuff, kind of like how we do for privacy, if you can find that. It's just like privacy. Like so many people are not doing the bare minimum. Just doing the bare minimum will put you a level higher. And our last question comes from an XMR chat reader who goes by Mu Nero. Mu Nero. Get it? I like it. Longtime fan. Thank you both. Thank you for being a fan for so long, listening, and we appreciate it. For Monero, what are the benefits and drawbacks of a hardware wallet over a software self-custody wallet? Is it wise to get one for storing or using larger amounts? Do you recommend Trezor? Why is a paper wallet not enough? I'm actually going to turn this one over to Henry because I don't know much and I don't have enough crypto that it's worth me looking into it yet. I want to say I'm not a fan of Trezor because I feel like they've had a couple data breaches. Although to be fair, that was like customer info. So I mean, use a fake name, use a privacy card, ship to a PO box and you're fine. But other than that, since you're a cake wallet, I feel like you would be expertly qualified to give an answer on this. Yeah, just to give a big breakdown. Either way, the number one thing is to avoid non-custodial wallets, right? You just want a situation where you own your funds. I think it's the equivalent in the privacy community of like, what's a good equivalent? What's like a, just an obvious thing that everybody just needs to stop doing? Stop reusing passwords or... Yes, yeah, so using the same password across every website is like the equivalent in my eyes of using a non-custodial or using a custodial wallet, like an exchange, because it's the easiest way to lose your funds. You don't actually own your money. You don't own your seeds. If you're not using a custodial wallet, you're already much safer. Now, there's a lot of nuances here. If you use a dedicated hardware wallet, the nice thing about it is it's air gapped right? So it doesn't connect to the internet. It is always offline unless you actually connect it to something. And even then, it's the hardware itself is not what's at risk. Now, theoretically, these devices should have additional security precautions to help protect your keys and, and whatnot. And I know historically, there have been some issues. People have found some security issues with both Ledger and Trezor devices. But I'm pretty sure almost all of them required physical access to the device. So it's not something that most people should probably concern themselves with. In terms of, you know, whether you should use so software that's self-custodial or a hardware wallet, I think they're actually a little bit different. So for context at Cake Wallet, we released in beta recently something called Cupcake, which is a companion app to Cake Wallet. And pretty much it's like an offline app that you set up on a second phone. So the idea here is you have a secure second device that you can keep offline and it's pretty much functioning as a ledger or a treasure would. And that's where your funds are stored and then you have to use your online phone to actually send the funds and do anything with them. So you can actually replicate the ledger treasure security model with devices. And I know Monarujo, which is another Monero wallet, also has their new Sidekick app as well. So you can use any of these apps that have a Sidekick app, and kind of try to replicate what you can achieve with Ledger and Trezor. And that way you don't have to buy dedicated hardware just for this. But yeah, I think best case scenario, you're using something like a hardware wallet or a hardware equivalent security model with something like a Sidekick application. And that way you get the best of all worlds. I have a Ledger that I got like 10 years ago and I just ordered a Stacks via Cake Wallet to do some like testing and help us out with some guides and stuff like that and just market things for because we support Ledger with Cake Wallet. So you can also use Ledger devices with open source self-custodial wallets as well, depending if the wallet supports it. So hopefully something there helped. Ultimately, again, just keep your seeds off of other people's computers and the cloud. Keep it to yourself and you're going to avoid most issues. And if you have a higher security model, then store it somewhere that's offline, like a cold wallet doesn't really matter which approach you take. In my opinion, they're all going to give you very high levels of security unless you're someone that's storing a lot of money and then these little differences matter to you. I don't know enough about crypto to have anything to add to that. So 
that will be all we have for this week. We talked about antivirus for Linux. We talked about physical security suggestions, and we talked about hardware and software crypto wallets. Thank you guys for tuning in and asking questions. We really appreciate your questions, and we appreciate your support for the podcast. If you are not already on Patreon, you can join our Q&As by joining Patreon, patreon.com slash surveillance pod and xmrchat.com slash surveillance pod. If you join Patreon, even at the $5 level, you get to ask questions. You get to join our Signal group chat with all of our other patrons. It's pretty lively in there. We have a lot of really good discussions. Pretty respectful, even though everybody clearly comes from very different backgrounds. And that's pretty cool that we're all united by our love of privacy. XMR chat is a one-time thing. It's going pretty well so far. It's a way for people to just ask like a one-off question. And in return, they can just send us a little bit of Monero. Yeah, all of your support keeps this podcast going. And we really appreciate each and every one of you. So thank you guys again for tuning in. Thank you for your questions. And we will see you with Surveillance Support 206 this coming weekend.